Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. How many of you know that God is good? He's good all the time. And he's always above all. Hallelujah. Give him the highest praise. Give him the highest praise. Come on, let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
Oh, praise the name of our God. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you right now, Lord, for this time. God, this feeding time. God, to feed the flock of God. To feed your people the word. God, I pray, God, that you would give me the articulation of thought and speech. God, and that you would give me the words to say. God, that will encourage your people and that would lift us in you and cause us, oh God, to be your people. Lord, we thank you for your word. Come on, everybody. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the word of God. And we praise you right now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Please go with me while you're still standing to Galatians chapter 1. And we're going to look at the first 10 verses of this first chapter. Galatians chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. Today starts the series that we will begin to journey through the book of Galatians. The Lord put it in my spirit earlier this week to begin to talk to our church about the gospel. And I have entitled this Back to the Gospel. That is the name of this series. But today we're going to talk about no other gospel. No other gospel. Galatians chapter 1, and I'm reading from the ESV translation, and that's the same translation you'll find on the screen on this morning. And it reads, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ, and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel Contrary to the one you receive, let him be accursed. Verse 10, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. No other gospel. No other gospel. You may be seated. Thank you so much. God bless you, ushers. The book of Galatians has been called the Christian's Declaration of Independence. Uh, many, many years ago, the Protestant Reformation, which was initiated although by many persons over the course of history, but it really came to a head under Martin Luther, who was a Catholic uh, presbyter or priest. And it was Martin Luther who began to extensively study the writings of Paul. And he began to read and study Galatians and wrote a commentary on the book. And also the epistle to the Romans. He began to read these writings and came to the deep revelation 
of the gospel that is of grace. It was in stark contrast to what the Catholic Church was teaching. The Catholic Church was teaching that salvation and your relationship with God had to have the intermediary of the church itself. They would sell indulgences and to get people out of hell, they would call them to give a bunch of money and things to the church in order to break free from whatever fears they may have had in regard to death and the afterlife. A lot of things that was not of the gospel. In one sentence, the book of Galatians is all about freedom. Freedom from sin, freedom from legalism, freedom in Christ. And this epistle to the Galatians, I believe, is still relevant today. It has a lot to say to us, the modern church. It warns us. And it corrects the course of the church. And it gets us back on the right track. Throughout history, the church has often gotten off track. It's gotten off track. And gotten on the tracks of legalism, traditions, backwards thinking, and habits that are derived from the flesh. But you see, our day today, as we see it in our culture, is laden with many liberation movements. People are woke today. They're conscious. They are aware today more than ever of the struggle, especially that blacks and minorities are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And people, this lets me know, are looking for freedom. They're looking for freedom from these systems of oppression Systems that put their foot down on them and keep them from excelling and doing better in life and in their world. But Galatians tells us that there is freedom. There is a freedom that you can have in your life that is a Christ freedom. I want you to know that as we take this journey, we're going to go chapter by chapter, verse by verse over the next few months through this book. And we are going to glean everything that we can Sunday after Sunday from this epistle to the Galatians. I believe that the church will only be as healthy as the preaching and teaching that comes over the pulpit. If this church is going to be the kind of church that God wants it to be, we have to get serious about the word. Verse 1 tells us, first, Paul, an apostle. He is an apostle. Now, today the modern person would say, what gives Paul the right to say what he's saying. How can he say that his words have any significance or bearing on somebody else? See, because we live in a culture today that is relative. It's all about what is good for you. The individual determines how they are going to interact and live in the world and oftentimes when you come to the Bible you come to the Word of God it says a lot of things that many times contradict what the world is telling you the world is telling you that you can make up your own rules the world is telling you that you can have it your way you can do what you want to do. Nobody can question you. If this is what you want in your life, go for what you want. 
But oftentimes it is void. That thinking is void of what the Bible teaches. It's void of what it says is true of all of humanity and what the need of humanity is. Paul has the authority to say what he is saying because he is an apostle. Now, he is a capital A apostle. Now, somebody would say, what are you talking about, Pastor? Now, Paul is what I'm calling a capital A apostle and not a small A apostle. Today, we have small A apostles. But the New Testament, the world in which your Bible, the New Testament was written in the Greek world. This was the time that Jesus in the first century had sent, had come down into the world, died for the sins of the world, and commissioned the 12 apostles. There will never again be 12 apostles. <laughs> the 12 apostles of the New Testament the disciples that Jesus called, there will never again be any apostles of that nature. But we have many apostles today who are missionaries, who are emissaries, who are envoys, who have been sent out to do works for the Lord. In fact, I would even say our dear founder right here at Miracle Temple, Bishop Clemens, would be considered a small A apostle because he pastored and went and started churches and here and there and did many missionary type of endeavors. That is an apostle that we can see today. However, Paul says that I did not become an, an apostle from men. And it was not through man. There was no man who called me out and said, you going to be an apostle. Today we have a whole lot of that. You go on social media. You go on to the internet. Folks can go on there and buy a license. <laughs> they can go on and buy a license and say, I'm a preacher, I'm a minister, I'm this or that. But listen what Paul is not saying. Can I talk to the church? Listen at what Paul is not saying, though. He says, I'm an apostle, not from man, not through man, but that does not mean that human people don't have a part to play in your calling. The calling itself does not come from man. But when God has really given you a calling, he will confirm it through man. That's why you get ordained. Because when you receive an ordination, you are in effect receiving the confirmation from those around you that see the gift of God on you. And they confirm and affirm that God has called you into ministry. Now you're going to see that right here in the book of Galatians when we get to chapter 2. I'm not going to talk about it today because that's not where we at. But in a couple weeks we'll get there. But he says again in verse 11 that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. It's not man's gospel. You see Man couldn't come up with this message. <laughs> Man could not conjure up. Man could not think up, manufacture up, contrive up, compose up, concoct up. The message that God the Father Raise Jesus from the dead. And that Jesus Christ gave himself, in verse 4, for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. 
Man could not come up with that kind of message. People could not talk that kind of talk. <laughs> because that's way over our heads. But Paul says in verse 12, and we're going to get there next week, that this message was received it wasn't given by man, but it was received through revelation of Jesus Christ. Listen, something you ought to know. It's good to know that when criticisms and accusations and persecutions come our way, it's good to know who called us. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes we get all bent out of shape. Because people get in our way. And people will say to you, you can't do that. How are you going to call yourself called to do this or that in the ministry? Well, you didn't call me. <laughs> it's not your business anyhow. Because... It's God who calls. It's God who brings people in to do his work. Titles are good. I know today we have this, this uh, ultra thinking about titles. Titles are all right. In and of themselves, they are good. But like anything else, we can make them not good. <laughs> Food is good, but if you abuse it, it's going to be bad. <laughs> you can't just eat everything you want to eat and think you're going to be all right. You're going to have some health problems. But listen, I want to tell you this. If man puts you up, they can bring you back down. But if God puts you up, there ain't nothing a man can do about it. <laughs> God is the one who will promote you. I think about my journey and where God brought me from. I, I sat in the second chair for quite some time and did everything I could to push forward the vision of my pastors and to encourage the work that they were doing and waited on God to put me in a position because I knew when I was five years old that I was going to pastor. When I was six years old, seven years old, I had down in my basement, my, my grandmother went and bought me a little robe and Got me a little pulpit. <laughs> and I had me a church down in my basement. Now, my home church in Buffalo, New York, was open door number five, Church of God in Christ. I started preaching when I was six, and I loved my home church, open door. So I named my church in my basement open door number six. And let me tell you something, I had children all over my neighborhood on Sundays. I would go to church and then I would come home after church. And I would get down there in my basement. My grandmother bought me a drum. She bought me an organ. She bought me a piano. She bought me a guitar. And I got my cousins and I said, you going to play the organ. <laughs> you going to play the drum. You go over there and get on that one. And we going to have church. <laughs> and I did that for a long time. My pastor, my grandmother got sick one, one day, was in the hospital. And um, I called my assistant pastor and I said, Elder, grandma's sick and... You know, I was that kid that just stuck with my grandmother. I stuck with her. If she needed the house cleaned, I cleaned the whole house. I, 
I, I did whatever she needed me to do. Things she didn't ask me to do, I just did it. That's how I was. I wanted to make sure it was done. I didn't like stuff out of order and unorganized. I, I liked the house nice. I liked to come in and folk take their coat and put it on the table. Who do you think you are? Take that coat out. <laughs> I, I like stuff right. Now, don't y'all talk, don't y'all talk to first lady now, don't, don't y'all. <laughs> uh, don't don't y'all call her and say, how pastor doing nowadays? Don't, <laughs> don't y'all do that. <laughs> but uh, my pastor came over the house and some of the saints, you know, that's how the saints used to be. You know, somebody was sick, everybody came over. Cleaned up the house. Cooked you dinner. That's what they did. And my pastor, I said, Pastor, look downstairs. I got a church down there. He said, now you ain't planning on starting no real church now, is you? I said, no, sir. I said, but you know. He said, yeah, I get it. And I went ahead and we kept on having church. <laughs> but... On a Sunday, I would have bikes going all through my grandmother's driveway. Kids all over the neighborhood would come. And eventually, I became a bishop. I took and I went all over the neighborhood and I went into my friend's house and I said to them, I said, now you going to pastor and you going to have a church in your house. And so I would go to every single one of their houses and I would set it up like a church. I'd get all the chairs in their house, bring it in there into the church area. And i say, now this is how you do it. Structure your service this way, do it that way. I was the boss. I had it together. And eventually I had me a state supervisor. and I had me a couple district missionaries. and These were all seven and eight year olds. And 10 year olds and I was having church y'all I called the convocation together and we had a state meeting in the basement <laughs> but when I look back over my life and I see where God has brought me from and I see the things he brought me through. Being talked about. Being a young boy growing up in the church. And, you know, when you're young, folk think they can just say and do whatever they want with you. They say, well, you can't, you, you don't talk back to adults. So I had to take it. Take what they were dishing out. Stood up over the church, made to apologize a thousand times for things I never did. <laughs> but I look back over all of that. And today I can say, when God elevates you, it's good. <laughs> then look at verse 2. Verse 2, I'm not going to talk like this through all of these verses. I've condensed them all together to make it right. Look at verse 2. He says, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Now, when he says to the churches of Galatia, realize there has been no small debate regarding who Paul is referring to. Now, Galatia is not a city. Notice he says, churches of Galatia. Galatia is a region. And the actual region today still exists in modern day Turkey. Now, in 285 BC, the original Galatians were Celts, C E L T S, who settled into Central Asia Minor. And years later, during the Roman conquests, this entire Galatian territory was expanded to southern Asia Minor, which included Poseidon, Laconia, and Phrygia. Now, when you read the book of Acts and you really chronicle 
the missionary journeys, which Paul had three of them. He started churches in North Galatia and traveled through South Galatia. Now that's Acts chapter 13 through 14, chapter 16, 1 through 5, and verse 6, and then later chapter 18 and verse 23. If I'm going too fast, I'm, eventually we're going to have this on Facebook and YouTube live, and right now they are putting it on YouTube. Y'all be able to go back and listen to it again. But Paul went through these areas strengthening the churches, witnessing about Christ. So the debate is in scholarship, which Galatia is Paul talking about? Is it north or south? And what I'm telling you all today is it don't matter. <laughs> now, I know somebody say, well, now that's pretty glib, Pastor. But see, I told you that because I want you to understand what we're reading. And when you do your own study, you can make a determination on your own when you study the book and you do your own study through the scripture. Then you come to your own conclusion. But it's not a hard line fact or what have you of which Galatia north or south he was talking to but we know he's talking to the churches that are in Galatia now he says in verse 6 he says now he moves from his greeting and immediately goes to his problem with the churches and says I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you. Remember I talked about the calling? Paul was called by Jesus the Son and God the Father. But it's the same God the Father and God the Son who has called the people into the grace of Christ. And now they are moving quickly away from the truth of the message that he preached. False teachers entered the church, troubled it, and infiltrated it with a distorted gospel. And the church bought it. Today, I think one of the problems is, is that we have a whole lot of churches that are buying into a false gospel. Buying into a false message. The believers were called with the same calling into the grace of Christ, but instead of living their lives in grace, they wandered into bondage. You know, it's a sad thing when bondage becomes more comfortable than freedom. The story was told that Harriet Tubman, the abolitionist, on her journey to liberating the slaves by way of the Underground Railroad would have delivered many more slaves if they only had known that they were slaves. Many, many people are in slavery and loving it. <laughs> they love their slavery. But you see, Israel had a similar problem. God delivered Israel from the hand of Pharaoh they got a taste of freedom, got out into the wilderness because of their unbelief and still wanted to go back to Egypt. You see, they were delivered physically, but mentally they were still in bondage. <laughs> their mind was still captivated by what had happened. You see, something happens to your mental when you have been under manipulation and control for a long time. When, when you have been under slavery, it produces a certain fear that traumatizes you and keeps you from really breaking free, breaking out. But if you're going to break free from bondage, you first got to confess that you're bound. You got to confess that you have a problem. But you see, the Galatians probably thought that these false teachers' message had some validity to it, so they bought into it. 
It sounded good. It looked good. It sounded correct, but it was bondage. Don't you know bondage is delusive? It looks like gold. It shines like it. But when you get it, it's misery. You see, these false teachers really wanted to bind them with this mixture of the law and Christ. See, you got to watch that because that often exists in the church today where we want Jesus and something else. Either it's Jesus or it's not. Hello, somebody. Either it's Jesus or it's not. When you really have Christ, you have everything that you need. There is nothing else that's needed. But these false teachers were saying, you need to have circumcision. If you're going to be saved, you need to be circumcised. Now, circumcision was the ritual act of incising or removing a male child's foreskin eight days after birth. You see that in Genesis chapter 17, verse 12, and Leviticus 12 and 3. This circumcision was instituted by God and it was given to Abraham as a sign of the covenant. And this circumcision divided between Jews and Gentiles. And circumcision became one of the greatest divisive issues in the early church. You, you'll see that this next go around, but it, you see that in and in and, and the book of Acts, where they came together in Acts chapter 16 at the Jerusalem Council, and the discussion was about, do we as Christians make the Gentile believers do what we as Jewish believers do? It's something similar to what has happened in America with the racial tension that exists here in America, where you have... Europeans, white people who took black Africans from West Africa and brought them to America and in many ways forced that's what many say, forced religion on them. Although if you really look at it Africans in many ways were not forced to be Christians because there is a whole lot of evidence that shows that even many Africans were Christians. And that was all over what we call the continent. It was not Africa back then. But today, what we know as Africa, there were many who had already heard the gospel of Christ. In fact, if you go back into the book of Acts, chapter I believe is 8, where Philip the evangelist is speaking to the Ethiopian eunuch. Hello. He's speaking to the Ethiopian eunuch and while he's on his way back to Ethiopia, which is Africa, he says that that Ethiopian eunuch was baptized by Philip, went back to Ethiopia and began to preach the gospel all over. So people were Christians in Africa long before we ever came to America. In fact, the gospel had reached the continent of, Af of Africa and North Africa especially long before it ever came to white people. Long before. But see, they took the message, they took the word and abused it and took Africans and said, you're going to be our slaves and you're going to work for us and, and this is for life. You're going to be under our hand for life. But that's not Christ-like. That's not God. That's not God's will. That's not how God operates. That's man. Hello, somebody. True circumcision, Paul said, was circumcision of the heart. While these Jewish believers were really sitting here fighting about circumcision, fighting about what was happening, 
in regard to circumcision, which was a outward physical manifestation of the covenant, they put their whole life, they staked their lives on circumcision. And the law which was given to them, the Ten Commandments, the entire Torah. And they misunderstood the real essence of the law and what God truly intended. Listen, the world's greatest New Testament scholar, I read this as I was in my study and I thought it was very interesting. N.T. Wright says, Paul's opponents are sometimes called Judaizers which is a misnomer because Jews do not Judaize. He says, to Judaize means to try to become Jewish. Only Gentiles can technically Judaize. Jews can proselytize. That is, urge male Gentiles to become proselytes or converts to Judaism by being circumcised. Whereas Gentiles who follow Jewish customs particularly by adopting circumcision, I said to Judaize. So it is more accurate to say that the Jewish Christian teachers, missionaries, or these intruders that came into the church are trying to proselytize Paul's Gentile converts by urging them to Judaize. He wanted, the, these intruders wanted these Gentile believers to become Jewish believers. Listen, when you became a Christian, you didn't lose your blackness. When you became a Christian, that didn't mean you left off your black heritage and culture. No, 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 no. You still black. Look at me. Listen, when, when, God, when God comes into your life, he does not, in effect, wipe away who you are as a person. He makes you better. He takes the things about you that are not consistent with him, and he transforms it. <laughs> Hello, someone. I'm sorry, but let me say this. Let me say this. But the church, we got to rise up. And we got to take accountability because one of the things that this text showed me is that many times we tend to mess people up with our religious doctrines that have nothing to do with the gospel. Church hurt is real. I know there's a whole lot of folk that say, it ain't real, get over it. Folk, you come into the church and you know, one of the reasons why people get hurt when they come to the church is because they do not expect people who profess to be saved to act like people in the world. They don't look for folk who say, I'm a child of God, to do the things that they were themselves doing. If they wanted that life, they could go back into the world. But most people have an understanding, I don't want to come into the church and do what I was doing before. I want to change. I want to be different. I want the word of God to really mean something in my life. I want a transformation. But sometimes everybody in the church is not saved. Everybody that go to church, y'all hear me today? Everybody that go to church is not filled with the Holy Ghost. And then you have some who is saved and is filled with the Holy Ghost, but you still got to realize that even they are still in process of God working on them. And sometimes we are not patient with one another. We're not, uh, I just said something. Sometimes we're not patient with one another. And we can bear with one another and work with each other until we can grow. One of the things about the church is it is a place 
of making disciples. Can I talk in this church? I'm almost done, y'all. I, I don't, I, I, am I boring, y'all? <laughs> the church is existing to make disciples. That's why we're here. But sometimes if we're not careful, we can find ourselves living and pattering our lives according to the flesh and not the spirit. And when we pattern ourselves according to the flesh, the dictates of the flesh, what the flesh wants, how the flesh wants it, we desert the grace of Christ. And the gospel begins to erode in the church and the church becomes about everything else but the gospel. Miracle Temple, what I really want, and I know everybody ain't here, but my God, I want Miracle Temple to go back to the gospel. We're not about anything else but the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we get here in this pulpit, we're not taking the Bible to beat folks over the head with it. We're not here to destroy people's lives. We're here to take the word of God and show you how God can change your life. How God wants to take you from where you are and he wants to grow you into the person he wants you to be. But you know what? That does not happen through fear-based methods. If I get up here and I preach, and let me tell you, I will preach about hell, but I'm not preaching about hell to make you feel like, oh, well, God is ready to send me to hell. I messed up yesterday. I'm on my way. No. John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him will what? Not perish. But they will have everlasting life. Listen, either you is or you ain't. Either you are saved and born again or you are not. There is no in between. If you are truly born again, there is a change that happens in your life. You have new desires. You don't want to keep doing what you was doing because you see that wasn't profitable. It was not fruitful. It had no benefit. You want to change. So church, we don't have to turn to a different gospel. People are hurting. They're confused. They're dying. People are destitute and they are looking for the authentic gospel, the true gospel, the real gospel. And listen, there are many false gospels in the world today. Many false preachers, many false teachers, many who teach a message that if you're saved, you'll never get sick, never have a day without money, You'll become a millionaire. Give this amount or that amount of money and watch a miracle come to you. Call my hotline and purchase this miracle water. Drink it. And your prayers will be answered. These are not the gospel. These are a different gospel. And Paul says in verse 6, not that there is another gospel. There is not another gospel. <laughs> These false teachers, they distort, they twist up, they pervert the gospel of Christ. Notice he's called, he calls them troublemakers. These false teachers, they are troublemakers. They claim to have it. They walk like they have it. They talk like they have it. They dress like they have it. But I can tell you today that everybody that looks the part, dresses the part, talks the part, is really not the part. <laughs> so you got to be careful because some folks will leave because of people. 
People who aren't really in Christ in the first place are the very ones who will run folk out the church. These are people who distort the truth of the gospel with antics and politics, stuff that the church can never grow off of. But verse 8 and 9 says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, claimed that he was visited by the angel Moroni. And Islam teaches that the angel Gabriel came and delivered the Quran to Muhammad. But these gospels, y'all not talking to me. These are not the gospel of Christ. Because these messages will tell you that Jesus is not the son of God. These messages will tell you that Jesus is only a prophet. He's just a good man. But the Bible and the message that Paul preached says that this is Jesus. Come on. Come on. Come on, preacher. Woo. Come on, preacher. Holiday old shy. Come on, preacher. This Jesus Come on, preacher. was born in a manger. Come on, preacher. This Jesus. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Born by a virgin. Come on, preacher. This Jesus on, walked the streets of Galilee. Healing the blind, cleansing the lepers, touching the sinners and the publicans. This Jesus, who sat down and his feet was clean by a prostitute. This Jesus. Hallelujah. This Jesus who, 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 who laid hands on the dead and they got up. This Jesus. He is the Jesus who was raised up from the dead. And when he got up from the dead, he said, all power. He said, all power. Not some power, but all power is in my hands. And then he said, I got the key. He said, I got the key to death, hell, and the grave. This is the Jesus that I'm preaching about. I'm not talking about Muhammad. I'm not talking about Harry Krishna. I'm not talking about Confucius. I'm talking about Jesus. <laughs> Somebody just lift up your hands and shout, Jesus! If they come to you preaching another gospel, he said they are anathema. The ban of God is on them. Because in truth, there is not another gospel. There is no other message. Uh, this is the message that'll save your life. This is the message that'll change your heart. When you talk about Jesus, you're not talking about some good man. You're not talking about somebody who just did good things. You're talking about God. Somebody shout hallelujah. You're talking about God in the flesh. The God man who eternally existed before the world began. John chapter 1 says that in the beginning was the word. <laughs> And the word was God. And the word was with God. But later on, John the writer says, this word became flesh and dwelt among us. Somebody shout glory. This Jesus. Woo. I feel like preaching in this house. This Jesus that I'm talking about. Somebody, the old folks said, he'll pick you up. <laughs> Woo, I shall know. He'll pick you up and turn you around. He'll place your feet on a solid ground. I wish somebody would just lift up your hands and say, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Hallelujah. Woo, I shall know.
Hallelujah. Ah. See, but don't, don't, don't let them come to you preaching about some other Jesus. <laughs> Tell, telling you, oh God, that if you just try to live your life on your own and do your own thing, that, that you don't need Jesus. See, the, the word on the street today is you don't have to have Jesus. If you want to live a good life, if you want to be a good person, you don't need Jesus to live a good life and, and, and be a good person. That's what they're telling you now. But let me tell you, that's another gospel. That's another message. It's not the message that I'm talking about. Because, see, the Jesus I'm talking about, he is wisdom. He is righteousness. He is the glory of God. The everlasting of the Father. Ah, let me calm down here. Ah, hallelujah. <laughs> ah, Jesus. But listen, listen. Listen. One of the problems is that we have a watered down gospel. The church, we can't afford to water down the message. Because we want people to be comfortable. We want to have a seeker sensitive type of church where people can come and they can sit and they feel comfortable knowing that they got sin in their lives, knowing that they're not right with God. You know, I understand that many people, y'all sit down, y'all sit down. <laughs> I, listen, I, I understand that we want folk to feel comfortable. And in some ways, we ought to make folk comfortable. But listen, we should never make folk comfortable at the expense of watering down the message. He says, to corrupt the gospel is to destroy the way of salvation and ruin souls. We don't want to ruin folk. We don't want to destroy folk. We want to build them. So let me tell you today, there is no other gospel. Amen. There is no other message like this one. This message is the message of truth. The message that will transform your life. Stand to your feet, everybody. Hallelujah. Listen, I want to I want to pray for somebody today. Somebody who says, I've heard all these other gospels and I, I wish I could get into the depth of some of these other gospels that are out here. But as we walk through this book of Galatians, I want you to go home and read it. Amen. Start studying it for yourself. And every Sunday as we come here, we're going to go back into the book to extract from it what God wants to say to us. But on today, I want to pray for somebody who says, I need that message in my life. I need the gospel in my heart, in my mind. I want my whole life to be infiltrated and saturated by the truth of the message that Jesus is the Son of God. Maybe you might not believe that. You might not intellectually believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And there are many people today who do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God many religions, Jehovah Witnesses that teach that Jesus is not the Son of God. But listen, you can't get to God the Father if you don't go through Jesus the Son. There's a whole lot of folk trying to skip out on Jesus so they can get to the Father. But nowadays in all of these various religions, I think it's really disingenuous when you say that all religions are the same because they're not the same 
and they all teach different things. There is no religion that teach all of the same thing. They might have some overlap, but only Christianity teaches that God came down. No other says that. God from heaven came down to rescue humanity. Whereas you might look at the Buddhists who don't even believe that there is a God. So no, they're not all the same. And so they can't all be one big melting pot because they're not the same. They don't have the same teachings and doctrines. But this faith says that God came down for you and for me. So dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending the Son, your eternal Son, who loved us and gave himself for our sins. Lord, we thank you for this first 10 verses of this first chapter. God, that we would come to know that there is no other gospel. There is no other message that can save our souls. For the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So God, I pray God that our very lives will be infiltrated and saturated by the truth of the gospel message. God, and that we will be a church shaped by the gospel. And dear Lord, I pray God, if there is anyone here, God, who has sickness in their body, pain in their body, I pray right now, Father, that you would heal those families who I bereaved today. Touch them. Comfort their hearts. God, I pray, God, those who are out of town, God, that you would bring them back home safely with protection all about them. God, I pray, God, as we enjoy our Memorial Day on tomorrow, God, that you would allow it to be filled with joy and laughter, fellowship with our families. God, and that your love would just be shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. And God, until we meet again, God, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I'm going to ask Missionary Cuffey, who did a phenomenal job on the day. Amen. She's going to come back and give us the benediction. Um, but let me say this. Um, I, I am a proponent of family. And I want everybody in here. Tomorrow's a holiday. It is Memorial Day. Now, I know this might be a little different but we will not have prayer on tomorrow night, okay? We will, could, we will come back on Tuesday for Bible study. Now, everybody ought to be praying. Amen. 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 I don't think that's going to hurt us if we don't come together on tomorrow night for prayer because everybody in the house ought to be praying. And so, thank you so much for reminding me. So tomorrow night, we won't be on Zoom for, for prayer, but we will be back on Tuesday. Y'all enjoy your Memorial Day. Get your barbecue. Get your grills out. Go get your food. Enjoy yourself. Amen. 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 You ought to smile sometimes when you're a Christian. All right. All right. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. Me and First Lady, we're going we to enjoy ourselves tomorrow. Amen. <laughs> so y'all enjoy yourselves with your families, all right? Is that okay? Amen. All right. Thank God you, bless God. you. God bless you. Amen. It's my understanding we have someone who wants to be a member of this body. Amen. So, that brother, I want you to come on. Brother Stanley. <laughs> He wants to be a part of this family. And um, listen, you all, this is the first person to come in to the church under my leadership. <laughs> and can I tell y'all something? 
this is the first of many. The first of many who are going to come into this church and find a home here. And uh, Brother Stanley, we're so happy to have you. And so real quick, while you all are standing, I just want you to just say something to us. Sure. Give us a brief testimony. Now, don't preach to us now, <laughs> but give us, a, give, us, okay. give, us, give us a brief testimony about how God brought you here, what he's doing in your well, life. It, 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 um, it started off, um, um, I was um, in the um, hospital, and um, I got, I got um, you know, this um, um, open heart surgery mm. about a month ago. Mm. And um, make a long story short, um, I went to um, this um, program, and I ran into Minister um, Primus, you know, and um, we just started talking. He mm. picked me up to take me back home from the facility. And, um, you know, and um, I was like, um, right then I was like looking for a church, you know, mm. in Bridgeport. And so finally, um, you know, we just started talking things about God, you know, mm. stuff about God and things, you know. He said, yo, brother, man. I said, yeah, I'm a drum. I play drums and everything, but it's not about the drums. It's not yes. about the gift, you know. It's about who gave me the gift, and that's yes. who I'm really striving to, you know, get locked in with, you yes. know, get rooted in. Yes. And, um, and God used um, minister um, premise to um, um, bring me to this, to, to this church, you know. And yes. he told me, um, how, you know, the congregation is, you yes. know, and um, he said it's brand new and they were looking for a drummer and, yes. you know, and, and um, the um, first lady was praying for a drummer and, yes. you know, I mean, um, you know, I'm the, I mean, God gives you what you, get, what you pray right. for, you know. That's right. But um, I'm, 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 I'm appreciative, you know. And we happy to have you. Yeah. I'm happy to <laughs> <laughs> we happy to have you. And so as every, every member we want to welcome this brother into our fellowship. And something that I'm going to always say, you're not joining a cult. Oh, amen you join in a church. <laughs> this, is, this is the body of Christ. And so I'm happy and proud to be your pastor. And everything that we can do to support you in your walk with God, that's what we're going to do. And so, and as a fellowship, you're going to be welcome into this family. Okay. We're going to love you. We're going to support you. We're going to help you. We know God's hand is on your life. And that's what he said. That's what he needs. So let's thank God for Brother Stanley on today. And in the future, uh, stay right here with me, Brother Stanley. Stay right here with me. In the future, all of our mem new members that come in, we're going to institute um, our new members class back. Um, and we're going to get that going soon again. I'm actually writing the book for it. And um, I'm about 52 pages in. And so um, don't worry. We ain't, we ain't <laughs> he said, oh, wow. <laughs> but, it, it, but it's about it's information. And I want people when they come into our church to join, they can really learn about who we are and the expectations of what it means to be a member of the church. And so right after the service, Brother Stanley, I want you to get connect with First Lady, who is our administrator. She's going to get your information, and we're going to be in touch with you. All right, let's give him another hand. All right, God bless. Missionary Cuffey. Praise God. I don't know about you, but I am full. I am bubbling over. We got, we got strength to go on through, through the week. Thank God. I am full. The word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And the word is also um, life, food, and me medicine to our health. So we've been, we've been fed and we're blessed. Thank God for the word. May we bow our head. Um, Lord, we thank you for the word. We thank you, Lord, for all that's been said and done, oh God. We thank you, O oh God, for all of your blessings and your benefits, O oh God. And regard as we prepare to leave this place, may you go with us, O oh God, to our several homes and take us there safely, O oh God. And may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ rest, rule, and abide with us now and forevermore. And may all God's people say, Amen. <laughs>